Hello, I am Sarita Vig from the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology Trivandrum. In this uh, series of lectures, I will be giving a basic introduction to stars and also talk about stellar evolution. So, what are stars? Uh, any body can be considered a star which is bound by self gravity and it has an uh, internal source of energy. When we say it is bound by self gravity, it naturally implies that it has to be spherical because the gravitational force is radial. And when we say that it radiates from an internal source, this internal source of energy could either be gravitational energy or it could also be a nuclear energy. Very often a nuclear energy source is what we understand uh, generally about stars. Uh, if we use this definition, then uh, how do you describe planets, asteroids and comets? Obviously, we know that these are not stars because they do not satisfy either the first or the second condition. If we look at asteroids and uh, comets, they are not bound by self gravity and if we look at planets, uh, the dominant source of energy is reflection of light from the sun. Although they may have some very little internal source of energy, they do not come under the category of stars. So, the closest star to us is the sun and which provides a very good reference for us to study stars. The next nearest star is uh, Proxima Century which uh, lies at 4.2 uh, light years away from us. Uh, a light year is a distance that corresponds to uh, how much the light takes to travel in a year. And if we consider the Milky Way, there are around Milky Way our galaxy, there are around 100 to 400 billion stars. Now, what is the composition of a star? What is a star made up of? So, it is gaseous plasma. Uh, in the center and it is made of gas around 70 per of which around 71 percent is hydrogen, around 27 percent is helium and a smaller fraction uh, is of heavier elements. Sun provides a very useful reference point for many parameters. For example, if we want, if we want to study stars and we want to know what its size is, what its mass is, how much energy it radiates, then uh, the parameters from the sun are very useful for this because all the parameters of other stars are usually measured with respect to the uh, solar parameters. So, here this table lists the various parameters of the sun. The first four are the measured properties uh, that can be measured directly uh, and the next four are the estimated properties which are indirectly measured. So, for example, the mass is around 2 10 power 30 kilograms, the radius is around 7 10 power 8 meters, the luminosity is around 3.8 10 power 26 watts which is the solar luminosity. As you can see these symbols the mass, radius and solar luminosity, they have a subscript with a circle and a dot in between and this circle and a dot is usually used to, to represent the solar parameters or the sun which is at the center of our solar system. The surface temperature of the sun is around 5780 Kelvin and the other uh, estimated properties that is the properties that are derived indirectly from other means either through modeling or uh, other indirect measurements of the age for example, which is around 4.5 uh, billion years, the density at the core or the center which is around 1.5 10 power 5 kilograms per meter cube, the core temperature which is 15 million Kelvin, one can compare this with the surface temperature of uh, uh, around 6000 Kelvin and finally, the core pressure which is of the order of 2.3 10 power 16 Pascal. One can compare this again with what uh, atmospheric pressure is which is of the order of 10 power 5 Pascal. So, the pressure at the center of the sun is nearly 10 power 11 uh, atmospheres. Now, uh, we will next look at the location of the stars in the sky and how we can identify a star by its location. So, we need to understand more about the sky. So, first and foremost, if we look at the sky, we see that there are a number of stars and the distance between two stars on the sky is usually measured in angles because the entire sky which is like a hemisphere to us at any given point of time at night if you are standing outside it appears like a hemisphere to us and this is called a celestial sphere and the distance between two stars can uh, therefore, be measured using angles. This angles could be degrees or radians and very often very small angular measurements are required and therefore, one degree is uh, actually made up of 60 arc minute and each arc minute is made up of uh, is 60 arc seconds. 
just for reference to get an idea the size of the sun and the size of the moon is approximately half a degree and if one wants to actually go and try to make measurements in the sky to get an idea of what uh, 10 degrees is like the right side figure for example displays this very well one can stretch out one's hand and uh, we ca one can get an idea using the uh, fingers as well as the full palm so if one stretches out if one stretches out the hand and then one finger the width of one finger roughly corresponds to 1 degree this is not accurate but this is just to give a feel of what the angular sizes or angular separation between stars are if one stretches out the full palm as shown then it is of the order of around 20 degrees and a fist is of the order of 10 degrees very often uh, the angles are very small suppose you are measuring two stars which, are, which have a very small separation which is shown again on the uh, bottom right figure so o is the observer and if you have two stars which are uh, separated by distance s we are assuming that both these stars are approximately at same distance from us uh, which is d then one can use a small angle approximation to calculate the if you know the angular separation between the stars one can calculate the linear separation between the stars so if theta is the angular separation between the stars that is the angle between these two stars and if we know the distance d then one can use the small angle approximation to calculate the linear distance uh, in kilometers or light years and that is given by s is equal to d theta when we do this kind of calculation or estimation we are taking the small angle approximation into consideration and small angle approximation would mean that sin theta is almost equivalent to theta or uh, with and tan theta is almost equivalent to theta provided theta is in radians. We next go on to look at the patterns of stars in the sky. Since a long time uh, humans have been looking at the stars in the sky and trying to identify different regions of the sky using the stellar patterns that is the star uh, appears to form certain patterns and usually mythological creatures and mythological figures were used to, to identify these uh, regions. Uh, so the left side figure actually shows the stars and uh, the imaginary lines are drawn to join them one can see a number of constellations these patterns in the sky are what is known as the constellations one can see Orion one can see Canis Major, Gemini, uh, but now the International Astronomical Union has actually divided the sky into uh, a number of constellations and these constellations have boundaries as is shown on the right side. For example, the Orion constellation is shown and the boundary as given by the uh, International Astronomical Union is also shown. So the entire sky as astronomers know is divided into regions with boundaries and uh, these are 88 constellations. Therefore, if you want to get an idea of where a particular star is or where a particular cosmic object is, then one can get an idea by looking in uh, a given constellation direction and there are 88 of official uh, constellations uh, by the IAU. It is important also to realize that these although uh, these stars have form a pattern in the sky these stars are not at same distance or need not be at same distance from us and uh, this figure illustrates this very well for example uh, the Orion constellation is shown one can see uh, a number of stars the top uh, Orion uh, represents hunter in the Greek mythology so one can see the belt where there are three stars and this uh, constellation is also very nice because it is present over, uh, over the uh, Indian sky for most of the uh, nights in the year and the belt <coughs> comprises of three stars the top left star is uh, the uh, called Betelgeuse uh, the bottom most right star is Rigel and as one can see from the figure uh, below earth is shown and then a series of distance distance is indicated through various uh, strips blue strips here and one can see that these stars actually lie at very different distances from each other but to us as a projection effect it appears that all the stars form a pattern therefore it's important to realize that although one when one sees constellation one sees patterns these uh, stars are actually at different distances from us most of the time We next to try to understand how we locate the position of a star in the given sky for this uh, we use uh, coordinate systems and uh, I will introduce you to two coordinate systems today. So what is shown on the left side for example is the sky that would appear to you as you are standing and looking up so the entire sky appears like a hemisphere and as I mentioned earlier this is the celestial sphere. So one can see on the left hand side the north direction, the south 
towards the left is the east and towards the right is the west and a number of constellations, number of stars are there, some appear bright to us, some appear faint to us. So when one wants to uh, describe a coordinate system, we first uh, define the celestial sphere. It is important that this, uh, to realize that when we are considering this coordinate system, all the stars are believed to be fixed onto the uh, sphere. In reality, we know that the stars are in space at different distances from us as mentioned in the earlier, uh, earlier slide. But for the purposes of the coordinate system, all the stars are assumed to be fixed on the, this dome of infinite radius which is known as the celestial sphere. This is shown on the right hand side and the circular plane on which the observer is standing that is known as the horizon and the point right on the top overhead is called the zenith. And uh, to explain this, the coordinate system, a good reference is the coordinates on the earth's surface. For example, earth is also a sphere and if you want to pinpoint a specific location, we use two angles. One is the latitude and one is the longitude. Now if one understands this concept of latitude, longitude, the same is extended even to the angles on the celestial sphere. So, uh, for example, in the, the latitude is defined as an angle which is measured from the equator. So, we define the equatorial plane and then measure angles from the equator to be 0 degrees and so on as we move towards the pole. And we define this equator to be this region uh, to be a large circle which cuts this uh, sphere of earth into two equal halves that is known as a great circle. So, a great circle is a circle which cuts a sphere into two halves and the center of the sphere always lies in the plane of the great circle. So, uh, the rotation axis that is the north south axis of the earth is perpendicular to this equatorial plane. The, so, this helps us define the latitude. Now, what about longitude? So, longitudes are uh, infinite great circles passing through the poles, but we need to start measuring at certain point. So, we uh, it has been decided to use Greenwich as a, a standard and therefore, all the longitudes are measured with respect to Greenwich. So, how does this compare with the celestial uh, with the spherical coordinates that we know? Because when we talk about spherical coordinates, there are three spherical coordinates, the radius r, theta and phi. On a celestial uh, sphere or on any sphere for that matter, the radius uh, is constant and therefore it is uh, unimportant. The two angles decide the location on the sphere which is theta and phi as shown on the diagram on the right hand side. So, as one can see theta uh, is the angle that the vector uh, makes with respect to the z axis. This is the normal convention, but for the case of the uh, in the case of latitude, we are actually measuring the angles not from the z axis, but from rather from the x y plane. So, the latitude is actually 90 minus theta. We prefer to use the latitude coordinate as 90 minus theta where we are measuring the angles from the x y plane and the uh, phi coordinate uh, represents the longitude which is measured from the x axis. Therefore, when we define the direction towards Greenwich or Greenwich uh, is decided to be along the x axis direction if one looks at uh, the figure on the right hand side. Similarly, one can extend this kind of coordinate system even to the sky. So, first and foremost uh, we look at the horizontal coordinate system. So, here again is shown as the celestial sphere. So, you have a celestial sphere, the point right overhead on your uh, which is on the celestial sphere visible to you is the zenith. And if one and the point uh, here it is not shown, but the point directly opposite to the zenith which is never visible to you is called the nadir. So, uh, if one wants to define the uh, coordinates, uh, the horizontal coordinates as is mentioned in, uh, in this slide, one actually draws a great circle passing through the zenith nadir and the star on the celestial sphere. Then the angle which the star makes with respect to the horizon is known as the altitude and the angle, so that is one angle that is equivalent to the latitude. And the angle that the great circle makes on the horizon from the north is known as azimuth. But from the north one can measure the angle either towards the east or towards the west. The convention is always to move towards the east. So, if one compares with the celestial uh, with the sorry with the spherical coordinates that we defined earlier, then the x y plane is the horizon and the north direction corresponds to the uh, x axis. The altitude is analogous to the latitude on earth and the azimuth is analogous to the longitude on earth.
but this kind of coordinate system is very local to the observer as one can see uh, from the figure on the right that an observer located at different locations on earth will be able to view only a certain part of the celestial sphere, certain hemispheres of the celestial sphere. For example, uh, if one is standing on the equator, one will only be able to see uh, certain regions, but if one is standing on the north pole, then only the northern part of the celestial sphere will be visible to that kind of observer. So, therefore, when one is measuring the altitude and azimuth coordinates, they are very local to the observer. And if you want to communicate the position of a star with a person in another location, then altitude azimuth can be used, but it is not the best uh, coordinates for direct uh, communication because one needs to convert it uh, to the what the person would be seeing on uh, from the other location. A more general or global coordinate system is the equatorial coordinate system, but to explain that we first ex uh, understand various terms uh, on the celestial sphere. We have already learned what uh, horizon is and we have seen what the zenith is. So, now let us look at some other points and circles on the celestial sphere. So, on the left hand figure one can see observers standing at a certain latitude on the earth and the horizon is shown as this uh, pink circle and the zenith point is also shown. Now, uh, if you extend the north south uh, rotation axis of the earth and extend it till this uh, celestial sphere, then it will intersect at two points. These two points correspond to the north celestial pole and the south celestial pole. And if one extends the equator of the earth, uh, the equatorial plane out to the celestial sphere, then it makes a great circle on the celestial sphere. This is known as the celestial equator. So, on this sphere one can always define what are the north celestial, uh, what is the north celestial pole, the south celestial pole and the um, celestial equator. So, from this uh, figure we also notice something uh, very uh, interesting. We see that uh, the observer uh, is at a certain latitude lambda, the angle between the zenith and the celestial equator is lambda which corresponds to the latitude and the angle between uh, the zenith and the north celestial pole is therefore 90 minus lambda because the angle between uh, the north celestial pole and the celestial equator is 90 degrees. This makes the angle between the north celestial pole and the uh, horizon to be uh, the latitude of the observer. Therefore, for a person at a given location uh, that is if the location is at a certain at an arbitrary uh, latitude lambda, the north celestial pole always appears to make an angle of uh, lambda with respect to the horizon. So, I will just draw this. So, this is the observer. This represents the horizon. This represents the celestial sphere, pardon the circle and if the observer is at a certain uh, latitude lambda, then the north celestial pole makes an angle of lambda with the horizon provided he is in the northern hemisphere. If he is in the southern, he or she is in the southern hemisphere, then the north celestial pole will make an angle of uh, uh, the latitude corresponding to the uh, southern hemisphere and uh, the zenith is located right on top as mentioned this the uh, point opposite to the zenith is nadir this is north celestial pole this is south celestial pole this is the horizon and the celestial equator is at 90 degrees with respect to the north celestial pole. So, from this figure one can understand where the north celestial pole would appear in your sky, where the zenith is and where one can locate this uh, great circle corresponding to the celestial equator. And this great circle which passes through the zenith and the north celestial pole in your sky and the nadir and the south celestial pole, this great circle is known as the meridian. So, this meridian also defines the north direction and the south direction because 
grades, uh, the meridian intersects the horizon at two points and the point which is closest to the north celestial pole is uh, designated north and the point closest to the south celestial pole is designated south and this decides the north and the south points and correspondingly one can define the east and the west point. These are east and west points are also the points uh, where the intersection of the horizon occurs with the celestial equator. So, these define the various uh, points as well as uh, circles on the celestial equator and these are used uh, to define the equatorial coordinates. Uh, as uh, mentioned in the previous slide, this slide shows uh, that the north celestial pole is uh, at an altitude of a lambda that uh, above the horizon that is the angle that the north celestial pole subtends with the horizon is equivalent to the latitude of the person. And, uh, Similarly, the celestial equator uh, subtends an angle of uh, the latitude with respect to the zenith in the southern direction for an observer in the northern hemisphere. Thus, from this, fi this figure also illustrates this very well. Here, one can see the north celestial pole, the zenith, uh, the celestial equator, as well as the meridian. So, this helps us def define what is the equatorial coordinate system. And in the equatorial coordinate system, now the xy plane is taken to be the celestial equator rather than the horizon. And therefore, the, there are two angles measured. The angle which is analogous to the uh, latitude is known as declination. This is the angle which is measured from the celestial equator. And the angle which is analogous to the longitude is uh, known as the right ascension. This is measured from a point on the celestial equator which is known as vernal equinox. We will come to it shortly, but for now we will proceed with that. So, these two angles help us define the what is known as the equatorial coordinate system. So, if one looks on uh, at the figure on the right hand side, one can see that this is a very convenient figure because in a, according to this figure the observer is at uh, the north celestial pole uh, and therefore the zenith corresponds to the north celestial pole and the horizon corresponds to the celestial equator. And if one wants to understand the equatorial coordinates of a star then one has to draw a great circle passing through the north celestial pole, uh, the star and the south celestial pole. Angle at the center of course that is the angle at earth which the star makes uh, from the celestial equator on this great circle is known as the declination. As I said earlier, this is analogous to the latitude and the angle on the, uh, the celestial equator from the direction of the uh, vernal equinox to the great circle passing through the star and the north celestial pole and south celestial pole that is known as the right ascension because we always measure it towards the east or towards the right. Again, if we consider the analogy given earlier, here the celestial equator corresponds to the xy plane and the direction towards the vernal equinox corresponds to the x direction. So, if an observer is standing at a given location. This represents the horizon. I am again drawing the celestial equator, pardon my circles again. And if it is an uh, arbitrary location, then the north celestial pole makes an angle of lambda and this is where the south celestial pole would be. The south celestial pole would never be uh, visible to this observer and uh, this point is the zenith, this is the nadir and one draws the celestial equator again and if there is a star in a given direction, then how would one estimate the right ascension and declination of the star? One actually uh, draws a great circle passing through the star north celestial pole and then from the center the angle that the star makes with respect to the celestial equator is this is the declination. 
declination is referred to by delta. So, this corresponds to the declination and if one uh, defines a vernal equinox to be a certain point on the celestial equator, then this is of course, north, this is south. So, this would be east. So, fr from the angle measured on the celestial equator, this angle towards the, to this great circle, this angle corresponds to the right ascension, which is denoted by alpha. So, this helps us define what is known as the equatorial coordinate system that is alpha and delta. And this is uh, not local to the observer because uh, this is defined for all the observers and therefore, uh, it is unique to all the observers. Therefore, wherever uh, an observer is, the uh, coordinates of the star would remain the same. Therefore, astronomers very often use the equatorial coordinate system uh, for uh, in order to locate the positions of the stars. This figure also illustrates this. Here one can see uh, that there are blue lines, blue circles indicating different uh, right ascensions and declination. The red, um, the arc sub, uh, the red arc which uh, uh, the star subtends is uh, the declination and the green arc which the um, star subtends on the celestial equator corresponds to the right ascension. Uh, the small circle from where the right ascension starts is uh, the point uh, known as vernal equinox on the celestial equator. While the declination is always measured in degrees, very often astronomers use time to measure the right ascension. Uh, so, therefore, 24 hours correspond to 360 degrees. Uh, this is because of uh, the rotation which is uh, which I will be talking about next. Uh, rotation the right ascension is measured in uh, hours. So, 24 hours is equal to 360 degrees which means 1 hour is equal to 15 degrees and 1 minute is equal to 15 arc minute and 1 second is equal to 15 arc second. Uh, it is found that because uh, the earth is not completely spherical, it has a bulge towards the equator. The gravitational effect of the moon and the sun on the bulge of the earth as well as the uh, effect of rotation of the earth causes a precession of the rotation axis of the earth. This is analogous to a spinning top because the gravity tends to pull the top down, but it is uh, top down, but it is spinning and as a result a torque is exerted uh, because of which uh, the rotation axis of uh, the top shows a precession motion. Similarly, here one can see that uh, the figure shows the effect of precession motion, but this precession is uh, effect of this precession is uh, cannot be completely ignored, but it is small. It is roughly 50 arc seconds per year. Uh, this was actually first found by Hipparchus and others when they have observed that the coordinates of the stars seem to be shifted by around 2 degrees over 150 years, which corresponds to roughly 50 arc seconds per year. This uh, would translate to around a precession time scale of around 26,000 years for the rotation axis and this precession would be along the, the rotation axis of the earth would uh, subtend a small circle as shown in the figure here. Currently, uh, the rotation axis is towards Polaris and therefore, Polaris is close to the north celestial pole, but as time goes by, Polaris would move away from the north celestial pole and probably after 13,000 years, Vega, uh, another star called Vega would be very close to the north celestial pole. Uh, Thus, we see that even though the coordinates of stars are given, very often we also associate a year, uh, a year with the given coordinates because of this precession effect. There are also other uh, precession effects during, uh, due to planets, but that effect is much smaller. But all these effects are usually taken into consideration while giving the coordinates of the star. Uh, so, for example, what is listed here is the bright, uh, coordinates of the star a brightest star in the night sky which is Sirius. The J2000 coordinates are listed as well as the uh, 1950 coordinates are listed. One can see that there are differences between the two because of the effects of precession. Also these coordinates uh, are given, uh, what is the first three numbers given are the uh, right ascension or alpha which is given in hours, minutes and seconds and uh, the last three numbers correspond to the declination which is given in degrees, arc minutes and arc seconds. 
So, this is how we uh, locate stars uh, in the sky. Before we go further, I would like to uh, introduce you to a, a software which is known as a Stellarium software for sky visualization. This is an open source software, planetarium one can say, it shows the realistic positions, it has a large number of catalogs and a number of parameters of various stars in the sky. One can actually visual, visualize in time how the sky would be changing, one can get parameters of various stars in the sky. Uh, this software is a, can be downloaded from this website stellarium.org, it can be installed on a computer laptop uh, and one can use this software to uh, locate stars in the sky and understand more about these stars, what, uh, what is the name of the star, what is its position, what is its magnitude and so on. I will show you a couple of screenshots. This is one screenshot for example, which also shows the positions of the constellations, uh, the patterns in the sky, it will help you understand the sky much better. One can also get a uh, lot of information about any star, planet, even information about uh, satellites is present in the software. Uh, so, I urge you to uh, download and use this software in order to understand the sky. You can also give the location, uh, any particular location on earth and one can uh, change the time and the rate at which the sky is changing to get an idea of how stars move in the sky. Next, uh, we consider the effect of rotation. The celestial sphere is fixed, but because of the rotation of the earth, it appears to us that the celestial sphere is moving in the opposite direction. The earth rotates from west to east and therefore, the stars appear to move from east to west. So, this defines the uh, path of the stars on the uh, celestial sphere and this figure illustrates this very well for uh, an arbitrary observer. One can see that uh, the uh, poles are marked and uh, the position of certain stars which are given by dots are shown and because of the rotation of earth, these uh, stars uh, seem, to, seem to move in uh, small circles as one can see and if the star is located on the celestial equator, then it subtends and uh, it follows a path which is the same as the celestial equator. This figure illustrates uh, the path of the stars for different locations. Uh, the left hand side for in instance uh, shows uh, the uh, an observer at the north celestial pole and uh, Therefore, the zenith corresponds to the north celestial pole, the horizon corresponds to the celestial equator and uh, for this observer only the uh, top uh, northern celestial hemisphere is visible and the uh, over uh, 24 hours duration the stars uh, seem to, uh, seem to uh, make small circles in the sky as shown in the figure. Uh, the other extreme is when uh, is uh, for an observer in the equator, for such an observer the celestial equator passes through the zenith and uh, the north celestial pole and south celestial poles are on the horizon and this uh, for an observer on the equator the uh, entire um, sky is visible because of the effect of rotation and the stars uh, therefore seem to have tracks uh, which are concentric with respect to the uh, rotation axis. And uh, the third third figure the on the right shows the um, sky, motion of the sky uh, as effect of rotation for an arbitrary observer. So, depending on where the north celestial pole is, the rotation of stars subtend uh, circles around this uh, north celestial pole. As we know the polaris uh, star is very close to the north celestial pole and therefore, it would appear fixed to us because uh, the rotation is along this uh, axis, the axis corresponding to the north celestial pole and the south celestial pole. Therefore, again I will draw and illustrate this once again. This is an observer and this corresponds to uh, the horizon, this is the celestial sphere. Again I am assuming that the observer is at uh, located at a latitude of lambda, latitude of lambda. So, this is the north celestial pole this is south celestial pole, this is the celestial equator. So, if we consider an arbitrary star here, this star would take a path which is something like this. 
it would follow a path like this and once it and it would move from east to west. So, this is the north direction, this is the south direction because that uh, the meridian defines the north south direction and then this would be the um, east, this is the west. So, the star would rise once it comes above horizon it rises, it rises, traverses the sky and then sets in the west direction. For a star which is located on the celestial equator, it would rise uh, at this point, travel along the celestial equator and then set in the west. Sorry, this is what I have drawn. And for a star in this direction, again it would rise in the east and set in the west. But this also shows that there are some stars which are always visible to us that depends on the latitude. So, some stars for example, would always be visible to us. When I say always visible, uh, we will not be able to see them during daytime because of the effect of the sun, but they are present there and uh, for example, during uh, total solar eclipse, one should be able to see them at the given locations. So, these stars are known as circumpolar stars and circumpolar stars are um, uh, the stars which can be seen as circumpolar stars are very local to a particular observer. And there are some stars uh, which are never visible. For example, the circles corresponding to this near the south celestial pole. These stars will never be visible to an observer uh, located at a latitude lambda. So, they, uh, the sky therefore comprises of stars for an observer uh, and there are stars which are circumpolar stars, there are stars which are never seen by the observer and then there are a large number of stars which actually rise and set for the uh, observer at that latitude. This uh, picture actually shows uh, the star trails that is uh, uh, to show the effect of rotation, uh, the photographer has actually uh, photographed uh, the path of the stars uh, by taking a long exposure image and one can see the star trails. This is of course in the southern hemisphere because it is in Paranal, Chile. So, one can uh, pinpoint the location of the south celestial pole and one can clearly see the effect of rotation of the stars from this image. In fact, an interesting thing is by the uh, by uh, measuring the angle uh, that the arc subtends, one can get an idea of the uh, rotation uh, exposure time uh, that went into taking this exposure because uh, 360 degrees would correspond to uh, the full rotation of a star about the axis. Suppose an observer were to look towards the east, then the stars would appear to move along, make a gray uh, circle. Suppose a star is on the celestial equator, it will appear to move along the celestial equator and similarly stars in the vicinity would make a parallel circle. So, so this is uh, evident uh, from uh, this uh, long exposure image showing the star trails uh, towards the east direction. This again shows uh, the daily motion of stars on the celestial sphere. So, uh, in the center is uh, what is shown uh, the path of stars uh, for an observer on the equator. Uh, so, all the stars uh, make um, the as the celestial equator passes uh, through the meridian, one can see that any star will uh, make this um, half great circle in the sky and similarly the other stars would follow the path as shown in the figure. Uh, the other two um, figures show uh, an observer uh, which is to the north and to the south, which part of the sky can they access and what is the path that the stars would take on, uh, on their sky. Uh, that is the sky which is local to that particular observer. We have uh, understood the path the stars would take on the sky for a given observer. Next we try to understand uh, the motion of the sun on the celestial sphere. Uh, we know that earth moves around the sun and this effect would mean that uh, the sun would appear to move on the celestial sphere to us. So, uh, first let, let us look at the image on the left which shows uh, the orbital motion of the earth around the sun. So, the 
rotation axis of the earth makes an angle of roughly 23 and a half degrees with respect to the uh, normal of the orbital plane. This orbital plane which is shown by the red line is known as the ecliptic plane. When we consider the celestial sphere concept, the earth is stationary and everything else is moving because of the effect of rotation as well as revolution. So, as the effect of revolution, we uh, as a consequence of revolution, we observe that the sun appears to move around the earth on, this, uh, on a plane which is known as ecliptic plane and this plane makes an angle of 23 and a half degrees with respect to the celestial equator. This is also visible uh, evident from the left side figure where one sees that the ecliptic plane is at an angle of 23 and a half degrees uh, with respect to the celestial equator. Uh, it is important to understand that this is the motion of the sun throughout the year that is uh, every day the sun moves approximately 1 degree on this ecliptic plane. This is because the sun has to cover 360 degrees on the celestial equator in 365 days. So, approximately it is 1 degree per day. This is the effect of uh, the revolution of earth around the sun. And if one sees the figure on the right hand side, one sees that the celestial equator and the ecliptic plane intersect at two points. These points are known as the equinoxes. Let us try to understand that. So, this figure for example, shows the daily motion of the sun in addition to the yearly motion of the sun on the celestial sphere. So, for an arbitrary uh, latitude, one can see the north celestial pole is marked, the horizon is marked. The celestial equator is marked using the orange great circle. The red great circle indicates the ecliptic. When the sun is on the celestial equator, then for one in 24 hours rotation, it will it will follow the path of the celestial equator because the effect of the rotation is to make a circle which corresponds to rotation about the north and south celestial pole as explained earlier. And as it is moving on the ecliptic plane for every day's motion will be indicated by a circle corresponding to that particular point. Here for example, three uh, the path of the sun on three different uh, locations, four different locations are shown. When the sun is above the ecliptic for example, by uh, on the left hand side by 23 and a half degrees that is, is, is it is at the highest point then one sees that the daily path of the sun is shown by this yellow circle on the top and this indicates the path of the sun during the summer solstice. Now, this as one can see over the horizon the sun travels quite a bit in the sky whereas below the horizon the path that the sun takes is much smaller. This would explain why the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere corresponds to the longest day. On the other hand, if one looks at the point on the ecliptic which is 23 and a half degrees below the celestial equator on the right that corresponds to the winter solstice and because of the effect of rotation on winter solstice, it uh, the sun follows a path shown by the uh, yellow circle which is below the celestial equator. And this one can see the sun spends uh, uh, a smaller fraction of the time above horizon as compared to below horizon and therefore, the days are short and the nights are longer during winter solstice. When the sun is on the celestial equator, then it follows a path on the celestial equator itself and this is shown by the orange circle. Then one can see that the time that the sun spends above the horizon and below the horizon is the same and therefore, the days and nights are equal. These two points correspond to the uh, vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox. So, uh, you are already familiar I am sure with these terms the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere corresponds to June 21st, winter solstice December 22nd, the vernal equinox falls on March 21st and the autumnal equinox on September 23rd. And this point on ma of March 21st, the vernal equinox corresponds to the point reference point from where the uh, right ascension is measured which we already discussed earlier. I will illustrate this again uh, using uh, an arbitrary latitude position. So, if this is the observer, again I draw the horizon 
the celestial equator the north celestial pole south celestial pole this is the celestial equator now i'll draw the ecliptic also which is at an angle of 23 and half degrees this is ecliptic this is celestial equator this is ecliptic now when the sun is here it follows a path given by this and when it is the sun is above the celestial equator the sun follows a path given by this circle so it rises from the east and sets on the west and during winter solstice it rises on the east and sets in the west but the path that it takes above the horizon is much smaller now and when it is on the equator it follows the same path as the celestial equator now as every day the sun for example traverses by roughly 1 degree corresponding to that one can for, uh, draw the path of the sun in the sky first presentation here are a list of uh, books and other resource material few textbook suggestions are given and uh, there are links to few animations please go and try out some of these animations as they will help you understand the sky better thank you